Good morning. My name is Connie McLaughlin and I work in DODD's MUI office. We'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, Choking Awareness, Risk and Prevention. Our speakers for today include Scott Phillips, Assistant Deputy Director of the MUI Unit, Kathy Blind and Dustin Poor, who are both regional managers and myself. Again, thank you so much for being here. We know this is a very important topic for the people that we support and all of us, and we appreciate your time today. I'm gonna now turn it over to Scott Phillips, and he's gonna talk, uh, um, he's gonna open us up today and then move on to our other speakers. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Connie. Very much appreciate the, the legwork on the upfront, and I think you covered all the details very well. Um, I want to echo what Connie said, and I want to thank everybody for their attendance today. I know, given everything that is going on and the craziness that has been the last year, um, that, that you guys have so much on your plate and can't appreciate you enough, and thank you for giving uh, an hour of your time today for us to talk about something that is very, very important to us, and I hope very important to you, and that's um, the prevention of choking episodes for folks that, that we support here in Ohio. Uh, I also want to take some time. I want to thank Connie and Dustin and Kathy for their participation. They've worked really hard to pull together some information and provide some good stuff for you today. So thank you guys for your work. Um, I, before we get started here, I, I always try to share this slide and I think it's important that, that we think about it, that the MUI process in Ohio is one that, that certainly is a quality health and welfare improvement process. And I like to start off by saying, you know, the reason that we report things, the reason that we look into them further, and the reason that we try to prevent them is because we have what we call a quality health and welfare improvement process. And each of you are a big part of that. Um, I got, a, I was lucky enough to see a, a snapshot of folks that were gonna be on the call today. And we have an amazing group um, on the call. We have direct support professionals, independent providers, agency providers, SSAs, IAs, we've got a, an amazing group of people and every one of you play a significant role in our MUI process and our quality improvement health and welfare process. And um, the work that you do is, is so important and it truly impacts the lives of, of the individuals, almost 100,000 people that we support here in Ohio. So thanks for the work that you do. Thanks for your part and the role that you play in the MUI system and can't appreciate you enough for all the work that you do. I want to go ahead and get started with what we're going to cover today, and we're going to cover several items. Uh, we're going to talk about what are the risks, and and before I get started, I want to I want to let you know that one of the reasons we're so we're able to give such good information related to choking is because you guys do such a great job of reporting and providing information through the incident tracking system. You guys have heard me speak before, and you know one of the things that I'm very excited about is that we have good data to share with you, so that the decisions that are made. Uh, the work that goes into preventing issues, it's all based on data and it's all based on outcomes that come from our incident tracking system. So we're going to talk to you today about what are the risks of choking? What are some things that we've seen through the system, through MUIs that have been reported that are really some of those significant risks and, and what can we do to, to avoid some of those risks or prevent some of those up front? We also have some really good information on what are the most common foods that people choke on? Some of them you would, would clearly expect like hot dogs and, and meat products, but there's some others that we'll share with you that maybe you weren't sure about and, and will be some good information to take away from today. We're gonna to talk about some assessments. How do we do risk assessment? How do we take a look at what is potentially a risk for the individuals that you support? And how do we do a good job of capturing that risk so that we move into the next item there and that the team can then take those risk assessments and make sure that there are really good outcomes associated with those risks that have been identified. And obviously you can't do that unless you do it in a really person-centered way. And we're gonna talk about some of those team discussions and how you can implement uh, some prevention pieces and do it in a real uh, person-centered way. We're also gonna talk about training, how, how different training can make a difference, monitoring strategies, um, and actually work on how that makes a difference and how we can prevent situations by the upfront training that we do and the ongoing monitoring that we do. And then finally, we're going to talk to you about some specific data. And, you know, the reality of this data is it makes it very real for you and for me and for all of us. You know, we have folks that pass away from choking episodes every year. We have people that are hospitalized and their lives are changed forever um, based on a choking episode every year. And each one of you that's on this call can make an, an incredible difference 
Um, you can prevent those kind of things from happening. And that's really what this kind of training and education is all about. Help us to get out in front of this, help us to think about things proactively so that we don't have to worry about the react reactions and, and, and certainly the subsequent follow-up that we know takes place. Here's some things that we know. Choking episodes are often preventable. I'm gonna say it again, because it's important. The check choking episodes that we see every year are often preventable. And I'll just give you some examples of that. You know, someone gets a diet texture um, that's not appropriate for them and they have a choking episode. Somebody has a uh, super, certain supervision requirement within their service plan and that supervision doesn't happen. Somebody walks, uh, walks by a table and grabs a half eaten hot dog and, and tosses it in their mouth real quick and runs, takes off running um, and has you know, a choking episode. So those are the kind of things that are preventable. And I think you guys all know that the folks we support, um, they're at greater risk for a lot of reasons. Many have to do with the intellectual and developmental disability. Uh, some have to do with aging, and we talked about that. Some have to do with medications that somebody has taken um, that might make them more susceptible. Uh, might have to do with a particular condition that they deal with. And the important thing to remember about choking is it can happen to anyone. So not only are there preventable issues, but there's choking episodes that are going to happen to people that you support out there. Um, and you just don't know why and you don't know when to expect it. You know, somebody that has a regular diet, doesn't have any issues at all, uh, could choke. And they can do it when, when you're caring for them. And so it's important to, to think about what you can do. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get further into the presentation today, too. The choking episodes can happen anywhere. They can happen on a vehicle. They can happen at a restaurant. They can happen at home. They can happen at, at work. They can happen at school. Uh, making sure that information is shared and very clear with all folks that are are touching the lives of the men and women and, and children that we support here in the system. Communication and proper supports are critical. And we're gonna talk about that in some more detail as we get through the presentation, but making sure that if there's a diet texture or there's a supervision requirement, that wherever that person is throughout their day, that we've done a really good job of being clear with those people providing supports, what that, um, what that intervention strategy is, you know, what that diet texture is, making sure that it happens at home, at work, at school, uh, even in the hospital. We have situations where people will go into a hospital and we've seen episodes where someone didn't get the right texture in a hospital, which you think, you know, how can that happen? But sometimes the communication hasn't happened in a way that, that really makes sense so that we make sure everybody has the detail that they need to, to protect people. And you know, training can make a difference. We're gonna talk to you about a lot of different ways and a lot of different things you can do today related to training to give, um, support staff, direct support professionals, anybody who touches folks during mealtimes, the information they need to make sure that that's a safe and, and, and certainly important time uh, for individuals. And then finally, you know, we can decrease the number of choking incidents that happen. We've done it many times throughout Ohio. We're gonna continue to address this topic or we continue to try to reduce the number of episodes that happen. And the simple fact that we have so many people tuning in today to hear information about how we can do that and what's going on, you know, I have no doubt that we're going to make progress uh, moving forward here. So we wanted to present some data and we'll continue to do this throughout today's presentation about the prevalence of choking incidents for the people that we support. It was really interesting to me that in 2020, we had 67 times uh, more medical emergency for choking incidents than we did for CPR for a cardiac event. And that says something, I think, and I think it kind of puts into perspective that while we're all trained in CPR and first aid, and that's probably the first thing we think about when we think about life-saving interventions, really, more often than not, the people that we support are going to need us also to be very well-trained and informed on what to do when a choking incident occurs. And so, you know, everyone we work with may not have a cardiac event, but everyone that we work with and support is probably eating, whether that's taking in food through a G-tube or only, um, you know, at least three times a day. And if you're me, more often than that. So, you know, the, um, the prevalence of something happening during a meal time or when someone's unattended or 
um, just any of the other times of the day where food is, is available is very common. And so we need to kind of wrap our minds around that and be kind of hypersensitive all the time. This is another really interesting statistic that it really only takes four to six minutes before a lack of oxygen from choking can cause brain damage or even death. So again, this is really just reiterating the importance of all of us when working with individuals to make sure that we're taking immediate action to um, make sure that airway gets unobstructed, to make sure that we're doing, you know, abdominal thrust, that we're calling 911, that we're getting help. Um, four to six minutes is not a lot of time in a crisis situation. And so what we don't have time for is to call your supervisor or to call someone else or to call that person's family member. What we need to be doing is responding immediately. And time and time again, you all have done this and saved people's lives. Um, we'll go over some data later in the presentation, but it's really, it's really amazing when you look at the number of life-saving interventions that a direct support professional or another caregiver has taken to save someone's life when there's been a choking incident. And so we want to continue that and we want to improve and we want to reduce the amount of times that we have to do those life-saving interventions. So we'll go on and share some additional information about specific MUI data as it results to choking, but thought these were really interesting statistics to share with you about the prevalence and about the need for immediate actions when someone chokes. So I'm going to turn this over to Scott and he's going to talk about special considerations for people with IDD. You know, some of those considerations that really impact the specific folks that we support, that we all support, uh, and, and certainly first and foremost is many folks have swallowing and aspiration issues that are certainly common for, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we've identified that swallowing risks are the highest uh, for persons with cerebral palsy. Um, and I think it's because you know that can affect muscles involved in swallowing and, and in your arms, legs, and in your neck. The risks and, and of difficulty with swallowing and aspiration certainly increases with age, as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, and that, that's for everyone. It doesn't matter if you have an intellectual disability or not. As you, as you age, the muscles within your throat and the ability to swallow all become impacted. And that's why you see people at, at various ages and with different physical conditions that might have a specialized diet that makes it safer for them to eat and drink um, without that concern of those risks related to, to swallowing. And there's several other mitigating risks. I wanna talk about, about many of these. And um, certainly pica, I think most of us probably know about pica, but pica is the ingestion of inedible objects. And so a lot of times, you know, we would see a, a choking episode come through our system where someone had eaten a, a button or a battery or um, a piece of wood or something that they picked up and they ate and certainly caused them to choke. So being very cautious and careful with folks that might display pica kind of behaviors um, is certainly important. And then also uh, poorly fitting dentures. I know that, that dentures, I think for a lot of people, you know, aren't easy to keep in and it can be a challenge, especially when you're chewing or eating. And sometimes those things can come loose. And we've seen situations where folks might choke on dentures because they, they came loose and they got partially swallowed. So making sure that if you're supporting someone that has dentures, that those things are, are, are well secured and the person feels good about eating with them or there's some kind of uh, decisions that the teams have made to, to make sure that it's safe during eating for those. And I think one of the most important, and I, I know all of you that responded to, to Connie's poll, probably many of the reasons that you, you'd identified or someone you knew was involved in a choking episode with someone is related to food stealing. Because I think as a system, we do a really nice job of trying to protect the individual, making sure they have the right diet texture, making sure they have the right supervision. But sometimes when someone's walking out of the dining room or walking in the, res in the restaurant or in the, in the grocery store, and they just, they, they grab something and they put it in their mouth quickly and, and they know probably that, that we might not want them to have it and might try to get it away from them. So they try to chew very quickly, eat very quickly, swallow very quickly. 
And that's where we see some real tragic outcomes related to uh, choking episodes, you know, as it relates to food stealing. Something that a lot of people don't know is, is that, that laying down 30 minutes, uh, within 30 minutes after eating certainly can cause a problem. And I, I, you know, I didn't always realize that, but once you eat, you want to try to be upright. You want to be, try to be moving around for that 30 minutes to make sure that, that everything has, has settled, has gone into your stomach. And, um, you know, many of the folks that we have might have some kind of uh, regurgitation issue or could potentially deal with something like that and making sure that, that the person doesn't uh, choke on something that they've already swallowed and trying to make sure that they're upright and moving around. And many folks we support have impulse control. And that's where, you know, clearly somebody might just grab someone else's food, might um, might not really think about something before they eat it. We've had folks that have uh, have eaten items like um, chicken that was thawing out or, or other information just as an impulse and certainly trying to think that through when you're thinking about potential risks with folks that you support, how to prevent any of those kind of things from happening. And I think I mentioned it just very briefly in the opening about um, eating in vehicles. Uh, we know it's a pretty significant trend over the last couple of years of episodes happening in in cars or vans when someone maybe goes through a drive through and it's probably, you know, even more prevalent now with, with the pandemic and the issues we've been dealing with, but would we'll go through a drive through and, and maybe hand someone their food in the back seat or hand some food back to somebody in the back of the van and, and then be driving, you know, on a highway or street and someone begins to choke and being able to intervene quickly is, is a challenge. You know, it's a, a real challenge in a vehicle to try to be able to do the Heimlich or to do the, the back blows and, and abdominal thrust that, might be required to help somebody through. So seriously, given serious consideration to eating in vehicles and how safe that is or isn't um, as it relates to the particular risk for that person. And then obviously uh, many, many folks that we support um, don't have teeth and they aren't interested in dentures. And so obviously making sure that those food items have the appropriate texture and the person's able to, to chew and swallow those um, safely. And then we talked about some of the reasons why there are kind of lack of muscle control or inabilities to, to swallow certain items and, and making sure, again, that that's part of your risk assessment and that we're making sure that the team comes up with some ways of effectively and allowing folks to have the foods that they want in a way that's safe. And that's that's the key piece. And there are some red flags that come up, particularly when you're when you're dealing with swallowing issues. And um, some of these are pretty you know evident, others maybe not so much. Um, if you see somebody avoiding certain foods, and that might be, you know, a harder food or a challenging texture, if you notice that for whatever reason, they just, you know, it's a newly acquired thing that they're not eating those items that they used to like or you thought that they liked, um, certainly that's a red flag. And we want to make sure that the team's aware of that, OT, PT, the physician, whoever might need to be involved to, to think about that. And this is probably the most important one. I want you all to really think about this um, with the folks that you support. If a person's coughing around meal times or snack times or when they're eating or drinking at any time, this is a strong red flag that there might be some swallowing issues occurring. Um, so again, before, during the meal or after any kind of coughing when the person's eating or drinking, red flags, make somebody aware of that and let's get somebody tested and make sure we see you know, whether or not they're having some kind of swallowing issue. Um, somebody that's got frequent upper respiratory infections or pneumonia, and I can just tell you for some of the data that we have in the MUI system of, you know, unanticipated hospitalization related to pneumonia or an aspiration pneumonia, we have quite a few of those. Um, so clearly, if you're seeing that, again, part of the reason that may be happening is because someone's aspirating on some food or drink, um, it's getting into their lungs and it's causing them to have the pneumonia or the, the aspiration pneumonia infection. So making sure that if somebody's being hospitalized for those kind of things, that you're really doing a good job of figuring out why those might be happening to that person, especially if it's, it's happening um, more frequently. And again, as we mentioned, if a person is aging, certainly they're more at risk. And then uh, the multiple med medications over time. If somebody's had a number of medications over time, you can be sure that that can um, could, can and will impact their ability to swallow. And so you got to keep an eye on that when you see the coughing, before, during, or after a meal related to that, make sure we're getting that checked out. Uh, unexplained fevers, which would mean just an, an unexplained infection of some kind can certainly be associated with that. Um, folks that are wheezing, um, and, you, and you might think, well, they have asthma. Well, that could be the case, but it also could be that they have some challenges swallowing and the person might be confused about it. So any kind of wheezing, whether it's associated with asthma or not, should certainly be checked out by 
and reported by you and your team to make sure that it's not related to a swallowing issue of some kind. And then certainly loss of appetite or unexplained weight loss, if that's happening um, pretty quickly and you're not really sure why, a lot of times that can be related back to not feeling comfortable swallowing, not wanting to eat certain foods. And as a result, um, having some situations where they might have some weight loss or, or loss of appetite. So these are just some red flags that we've identified through some review of the cases that we've got and some good information that has been shared with us um, through various resources. I mentioned I want to let you know a little bit about some of the most common foods. And again, some of these you're going to all know because you've heard us speak about them many, many, many times. That first one up there, peanut butter. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that, that doesn't know that peanut butter and hot dogs are two really, really rough items. And and why do they have to be so daggone good and everybody likes them so much? Um, but certainly from the data that we've got and the, and the information that we've seen through MUIs, uh, peanut butter and hot dogs. And if you if you combine peanut butter with a big soft um, you know, Wonder Bread, or even a hot dog with a, a really nice uh, soft bun. Those two combinations, we've got them noted there, of uh, the different textures is what forms that bolus that impacts and, and, and blocks the airway. So really, really important that, that the hot dogs and the peanut butter, especially when mixed with two combination of textures, so that those are items that are really assessed. Um, people don't think a lot about this, but waffles with syrup, that's two combinations. You know, bread, biscuits or something with butter and honey, that's two combinations that form that solid bolus. Um, so really thinking through the diets and the menus um, that you guys have out there to try to avoid, you know, some of these things that are clearly identified as, as really significant choking needs. And then if you take a look at the, uh, at the chart there to the right, you can see a lot of meats. You see hot dogs, you see sausage, you see hamburger, you see chicken, you see steak, you see ham. All of those meats are identified clearly as high choking needs. And again, information, this is, these are foods that everybody likes. So we're not saying that people can never eat or should never eat these things. What we're saying is make sure you know they're identified as high risk choking uh, foods and that we try to prepare and plan as much as you can in advance um, to keep that from happening to the person that you're supporting. And you get to the next items here and, and these Sometimes people don't think about, but those round kind of slippery and firm foods like uh, grapes, cherry tomatoes that are, you know, hard candies like that are round, that are just about as big as your as the back of your throat. Those are the things that, you know, if they're swallowed before they get chewed properly can certainly block the airway and cause a significant um, choking episode. And then uh, certainly the, the nuts and raw vegetables, and you can see some of those in that picture as well and, and why those might be. Uh, something that would be a problem. Um, apples cut up in pieces that are chunked. Um, again, really good foods, but really good foods that can be choking hazards. And and you guys need to think about, um, particularly for the folks that you're you're supporting every day. Uh, I I, th I feel like we've pulled a lot of information from the MUI reports to give you this list. There certainly are more. I don't want this you to think this is the, the exhaustive list. These are the ones that we have found uh, most likely. You know, potentially to cause a problem for choking episodes for folks. All right, I think I am going to turn things over to Kathy real quick to talk about some immediate actions as it relates to, to choking episodes. Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so some immediate actions and what Scott was talking about, the types of foods that people choke on, and he had uh, mentioned about how you know, we're getting this information from your from you guys. You're finding it out. You're reporting it. Um, so all of that is a, a very important that you continue to do that. But when somebody is choking, we immediately want to. We 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 like Han mentioned about we don't want to call our supervisor to say somebody's choking or a guardian or a family member. We want to call 911 and we want to immediately start that choking relief. Follow your training. If you once you start your choking uh, relief, if it's back blows or coughing. Um, uh, or CPR, whatever the case may be, you want to you know, follow your training. Make sure that you continue doing that until you know it's resolved or help arrives to help you. So, uh, also medical evaluations following the incident. If somebody's choking or has choked, and you've you've had to go with back blows or the Heimlich, or or CPR in some regards, I know a lot of people want to get back once they resolve the problem. They want to start eating again. We're going to be very careful of that. Um, we talked about the aspirations, whether it be silent or not. We want to make sure it, you, know, you have the ability to get somebody to be checked out 
um, before they resume eating or drinking. Um, do you want to take actions to make sure whatever your policies are, check with your agency, uh, your supervisor or whatnot to make sure you're following it and, and also providers making sure your staff is, is 100% trained because when the time comes that somebody chokes, and as Connie said, 67% more likely that you're going to do a choking intervention, um, you want to be ready because it's a shock. It, I've had to do it. It's You panic for a minute. Uh, it's normal to kind of like, what What am I seeing? What's happening? So the more you practice things like that, doing immediate actions, um, when something does happen, following your, your agency's policies. And then you want to make sure you supervise and provide close monitoring afterwards to make sure they're okay. Um, it's, it is a trauma uh, for, for the individual and, and person who had to to implement that relief. So make sure you're monitoring the person and, and supervising them closely. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make a, one comment and that is related to the, you know, kind of what happens after. And, and just because of some of the cases that we have reviewed is, and we've had some situations where someone has choked and people have felt like the item has been removed or that the, the person is okay. And then they, they then leave and, and maybe go back to their bedroom or go to the bathroom or something. And then to find out that, that the item hadn't fully been removed. So I guess I just wanted to kind of reiterate what you said. And that is, if somebody does have a choking episode, let's really make sure that we get them looked at. We make sure that we feel really, really confident that um, all is well after the choking episode, because we have had some some pretty tragic episodes where, you know, we thought the person was OK. And then they, they kind of went to the bedroom or bathroom. And we found them later and they weren't doing well. So just wanted to make sure I clarified that, too. Perfect. And also, too, just to kind of echo on that a little bit, you know, the, uh, normally we think a person, when they start choking, they're going to put their hand on their throat. Not everybody does that, especially individuals, you know, uh, that we are supporting. So sometimes they run, uh, they get up and they run or they get up and they go to a favorite chair or their bedroom, like Scott mentioned, and because they're, that's where it's safe, they feel. So be mindful of that. If you see somebody just get up and start taking off running, even if the person that typically would do something like that, just make sure they're okay. Um, well, I want to kind of cover just quickly, just a few cases. These are real live MUI cases of events of choking that, that we've reviewed. Um, and sometimes just knowing these and maybe checking in with staff or staff checking in with supervisors just to make sure, because this, these things unfortunately happened. Um, in this first case, there was an individual. He had a very strict diet. He did not like it. He, um, he didn't have any uh, real good swallowing um, strengths. He, he, wasn't, he didn't have any teeth, and he did not like his food to be prepared. Uh, he's very adamant. He's, he's very physically aggressive when somebody tried to do it. The staff that was working had been trained. She'd been there for many, many years, um, and she did not follow his plan because she was afraid to. She didn't communicate her fear. Nobody knows, you know, so when he chokes, the first thing we're trying to figure out is what happened, how did it happen, you know, were we, were, do, is there anything we should have been doing differently? And we find out that she was not doing the proper meal plan. And when she was interviewed, it was because she was afraid of his physical aggression. So those are real fears. I mean, I, I, and we certainly don't want him to choke, but we certainly want to make sure staff is in a good place to be able to provide the supports that they need to keep that person safe. So have these communications, have these discussions. Uh, with staff, staff with your supervisors or with the team, so everybody can get on the what what can we do to make sure this person is safe? Uh, second case there, we had an individual that um, she didn't really have a lot of uh, verbal communication skills. She would eat fast. Uh, she needed some assistance with staff. One, one of the problems here when she did choke on some food, we were able uh, they were able to um, successfully dislodge the food. But when we were reviewing the case, some of the questions, and by the way, uh, for those who are county board or IAs that are doing these um, investigations and you start putting something on ITS for a choking, you know, the department, we're, we are going to be wanting to make sure we know as much about what happened as possible. So please don't be offended if there's questions on, on ITS asking very specific questions. What was happening? What were they eating? Why did it happen today? Things like that. Um, did we have a drink? Were they laughing? Were they sick? Were they, you know, moving around in their chair? These are all things that can kind of contribute to a choking event. And in this case number two that I'm talking about, many of those things actually happened. Um, the staff was taking proper supervision. They, she, the individual sat down at her chair. <clears throat> 
excuse me, she put the plate of food in front of her, it was properly prepared. And uh, then the staff went and got the um, drink. And then she brought the drink. Mind you, the food's already in front of the individual. Uh, then the staff got up and got a clothing protector, um, put all that on her. Food's already now being put into the individual. She's eating her, you know, her food while the staff is putting this uh, clothing protector on. And then realized that you know she needs to sit up at a 90 degree angle. So she props her up a little bit better. She repositions her. And mind you, the food's already in her mouth and she starts to choke. So while the staff was trying to do everything for the plan and had no ill feelings or intentions, uh, the, it was felt that she contributed to the event happening because now we're moving somebody when they have food in their mouth. We haven't gotten the drink immediately. You know, so we want to make sure that in that case that everything is prepared in, in front of that individual before you put the plate of food down. So there were a lot of moving parts to that case that uh, we've got some really good prevention planning taken care of. And, um, and I think the um, I, I haven't received any more cases on choking from her. So I think that sounds like it worked out wonderful. Uh, this last one we see, unfortunately, we see a lot of choking uh, events happen because either the staff assigned is unfamiliar to the plan or the individual. The staff is new. The staff was a drop-in staff. It was last minute had to fill a spot. Uh, we completely get that that happens, but we really got to make sure that that staff is trained and very familiar with what's happening um, in that in that individual's uh, life as far as you know risks. And this particular day, um, this individual she ate fine. The staff who was supposed to be assigned to her or who was assigned to her was also the one cooking, grilling out on the cookout. Everybody was all excited. We're having a cookout. And you know how fun that is, truly. And so if you're having fun as a staff, guarantee it, individuals are also having fun. But the person who's supposed to be supervising the individual who was supervising her while she ate her food happened to continue cooking and grilling out. But the problem was in this case is that her peer had food left out and nobody really knew that that was something we needed to pay attention to. So this individual grabbed the food and uh, proceeded to choke. So uh, just, just be mindful of that. It, unfortunately, sometimes when chokings happen, it's maybe somebody's got a little lax. We feel it's a little bit more comfortable in, in a, at a quieter time because people are eating, but that's the most dangerous time, especially when people have these issues. So uh, next uh, slide, I'm gonna turn over to Dustin. He's gonna talk about roles of the team. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm going to be talking about the role of the team and outline for you what a good team process entails, which in turn creates strong preventative measures. And, and we're going to start with the assessment and the evaluations. And, and with this information, this helps us understand how to best support people and allows us to build around the person. Um, this is where we identify risks such as choking, what it looks like, you know, where it occurs and how best to support the individual. And, you know the individuals best, so we want to make sure we gather that valuable input so that our assessments are rich with good information. And remember, every team member plays a key role in an individual's life, so we want to make sure we include all members in the assessment process. Um, so, you know, what were the results and recommendations from our assessments? You know, keep in mind that on the surface, we might think that food is important to someone, but we want to also learn information to why food is important. Um, you know, once we have this information, we're going to move into team discussion. And here, we're going to dig deeper. We're going to evaluate risks, the important fours and important twos. And we, we learn through discussion that past experiences have led to a risk and, and specific to choking, and perhaps even more specific to eating too fast. Um, so, you know, are there recommendations to consider based on an individual's history, uh, their diet, current supervision, and or other tracking that has taken place? Um, team discussion should include important figures associated with individual's care. For instance, if the doctors have diet recommendations, let's make sure they are involved to help identify what the diet plan looks like. Additionally, I know that the OISP will want to ensure a person's dignity is always considered through those conversations. And, and really what I mean by that is taking that person-centered approach to incorporate those important twos 
in fours in a manner that promotes the individual. And um, we love examples. Um, so, you know, starting with the risk, um, has there has this been clearly addressed in the plan with the individual? Are, are these guidelines in, included in our planning process? And the OISP, if there are recommendations made for a diet texture change, have we sat down to identify um, how that will be prepared for all foods? Have we considered foods that might be of higher risk? Um, you know, are there foods that are really important to an individual? You know, maybe the high risk foods are the same foods um, that are important to an individual. And, and let's say an individual begins stealing food as a result of a diet change. Um, we now have a new risk, perhaps a higher one. Um, and let's say that individual likes candy bars. Um, I mean, they are delicious. I personally love candy bars. Um, but have we talked to the physician about this specific food? Um, for instance, is there any chance he can have, um, he or she can have a three musketeers bar versus a Snickers? The textures are very, very different. Um, this takes into account the individual's dignity, but still addresses the risk. And this will vary case by case. And having those meaningful discussions will allow a greater chance to minimize the risk while ensuring the important twos and fours are captured for an individual. Um, and once we have addressed items in a person-centered manner, we have great information in the plan, we then must think about training. You know, and training should address who will provide the training, who will be responsible for actions, and when training will be completed. In cases regarding choking where a person has a specified diet texture or specifics on food prep, we need to make sure folks are thoroughly trained on what that looks like. Um, you know, think outside the box and include all teaching techniques. Use pictures, demonstrations, and, and follow-up to ensure folks feel confident with training that has been received. You know, we increase the success for all when we take the time to, to educate, which in turn helps decrease risk significantly. And in my experience, you know, people often, you know, don't always know how to access resources or know who to ask if they don't understand something. Um, so, you know, that leads us to communication and communication is key in the role of the team and, and not just in one area, but all areas, you know, throughout the process, we want to make sure risks, strategies, guidelines, or, or updates are communicated across all settings and documented. And, you know, there shouldn't be any gaps as gaps present unaddressed risk. So in focusing more specifically on assessing choking risk, you know, our ongoing assessments are, are critical to managing those risks. And this slide walks us through common questions we should consider in all of our assessments and really beyond the assessment stage. So, you know, just because we ask it once, address it, we still want to reconsider things um, as things may change. And, and we need to look at all previous MUI prevention plans for choking incidents. You know, what has been done in the past is a good indicator of what we can do better for the future. Um, you know, are there gaps? Are there things we need to modify? Um, there is always the potential to learn and grow here. And, you know, has there been changes with medications? that have affected mental status or an individual's ability to swallow. Um, you know, think about other factors, including um, urinary tract inf infections, for instance, which can affect mental status and take in consideration um, any trauma that has occurred in someone's life, whether physical or mental. Has there been a change with individual's level of care or has there been an acute medical condition which has caused an increased choking risk? You know, with acute illness, we know they generally develop suddenly and last a short time. So often only a few days or weeks, but in those time frames, they can really affect one's typical abilities. Um, and with any new diagnosis or change in abilities, we need to consider how this impacts individuals' abilities to chew or swallow. You know, has there been a swallowing evaluation completed? You know, when did it occur and, and what were those results? Does the person eat at an appropriate rate? And have we considered previous trauma on how to promote that person's dignity all while ensuring that person is safe? And in asking these types of questions ongoing, we can better address the risk as a team and develop some great preventative measures. And again, the key is prevention here. Um, this is an example pulled from the OISP module training that 
you know, you can take on my learning through DODD. Um, you know, SSAs, I believe, are required to take this training. However, if you find the time in your busy schedule, you know, go and take the training as this is this is the template that's going to be utilized. And then this portion speaks to the assessment area and will address known and likely risk. This includes the level of supervision, any MUI trends and preventive measures, as well as any restrictive measures. And you know, as you can see, each column will address important aspects to consider in someone's life. You know, what the risk is, what it looks like, where it occurs, and um, what the support must look like and why that person needs the support. And this to me is one of the most important pieces where anyone who supports the individual will know exactly what to do to assist the person. Additionally, you know, I'm talking with folks from the OISP group, there might be capabilities to build in training visuals, uh, links to resources to demonstrate what the support looks like, as well as enhanced training, um, which creates greater success for our individuals served and folks working with our individuals. Um, you know, does this risk require supervision? This section will be captured through um, drop down choices with definitions, which will allow for greater consistency and un understanding for a person's needed supervision levels. And, you know, lastly, who's going to be responsible for all these things? You know, this is going to be determined through your, your team discussions um, and be specific to each person. Um, so each of these sections will be addressed through continued communication as a team. Next slide. Um, so with all that said, um, we must know that the assessment and evaluation is, is truly ongoing. Um, this slide is a great example of a step-by-step -step walkthrough of what to do when there are swallowing concerns. And in reading this, it's, it's very clear cut. Um, these steps can save someone's life. Um, we can contribute for a lot of choking incidents and deaths being caused by a breakdown in process and implementation. So, you know, I can't stress enough that if you have an individual with a choking risk, make sure you have a plan in place. You know, pay attention to the red flags, um, communicate, be proactive versus reactive, make sure you have good follow-up and so on. Um, once a plan or prevention is implemented, you know, reassess and work back through the process. When we are having, you know, good team discussion, remember communication is continuous. It does not end when the assessment or the ISP is finalized. Um, next slide. So team discussions um, and team process is gonna look different for everyone, but having good communication should be consistent. 2020 has taught us to be creative using technology to connect with individuals, team members, um, you know, attending doctor's appointments and so on. You know, communication, doesn't have to be face to face. And you know, how communication is facilitated is not important, but what is important is ongoing communication. Um, and looking at the bullet points here, we, we must have discussion as it's related to nutrition. And remember, we need food daily. Um, you know, it is important, it's an important part of our day. And you know, personally for me, the hanger is real. I mean, I'm the type of person that thinks about food all day long, and, and I really look forward to eating. So it might sound strange, but I even enjoy the sensation of eating. Um, so when we talk about food and we talk about risk, you know, you know, are we taking in that rich information gathered through the assessment um, to ensure we have identified what the risk is, what it looks like, and again, where it occurs? And in addition to what supports um, look like and understanding, you know, why the person needs this support. We want to make sure we're taking in consideration the best nutrition options um, and including the individual vital team members and so on, uh, which again will lead to one's personal enjoyment of food and increased uh, choices. Um, and then that last bullet point on that slide was, you know, we must talk about safety. Um, and, and really there we want to make sure folks are educated on their own risks, the support staff know the risk, and that we discuss training and what it looks like. Um, and this is really all about prevention. Um, and then here with person-centered planning, so we want to really carefully consider the way we support people and build around the person based on the assessment and evaluation and through ongoing team discussion. Um, so does the plan clearly identify the risk, the assessed needs, and identify the risk um, and how it's going to be addressed? You know, have we taken in consideration the important twos and the important fours? 
And if the individual does not want to follow a diet change um, or a texture change, you know, have we provided education? Do they know the risk? Have we explored other options that would potentially include those preferred foods or foods that might be important presented in a manner that, again, addresses risk, but balances that important to and important for? You know, these are all aspects to consider as a team and how we become person-centered with our approach. So we, we all have such valuable information to offer. And by assessing continuously, we're going to create those effective prevention plans that minimize risk while promoting a person's dignity and choice. And um, I know that's a lot, um, but with, with all of this piece, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy, who's going to dive a little bit deeper into the considerations and uh, effective preventative strategies. Thanks, Dustin. So on this slide, we, we, I kind of already talked about them. We're going to kind of go through it quickly. We're just making sure everybody's plan addresses not just the meal, but the snacks. Um, and if other peers have food out, you want to make sure that your supervision is understood and clear. What does visual mean or is it versus one-on-one -on -one supervision? Talk with the staff. Staff talk with this, you know, the team, um, making sure everybody's 100% in their training. We're, we're encouraging and making sure the communication across all environments, that's crazy critical. You have to make sure the day programming, the, the, the family, everybody knows what to do. The one example of a quick death case we had, unfortunately, individual was very motivated by, by pop. Um, and the, he was unfortunately on a fluid restriction. And so the staff, there was really no outline on what to do to keep his restriction, but yet get him to eat. So he, they, they gave him his pop after his meal. Well, he gobbled his pop, or his meal to get to the pop and that caused a choking and he ultimately he passed. So make sure that we're aware of what are we going to do if this happens, if somebody's on a diet restriction, I mean, a fluid restriction. Preventive measures, making sure the assessments are, are uh, do you complete them when the person comes to your, your agency? Do it annually and anytime changes occur. Look for patterns of choking. Look at the UI reports. It may not be an MUI, but try to figure it out and get as deep as you can to figure out what was happening on this particular day. If there is a change in the diet, you have to make sure that you, you communicate. Everybody's talking. We're meeting together. We're brainstorming. You know, you're not, you're not on an island. So reach out to others and what can we do to kind of help prevent choking? Next slide, please. Uh, you want to make sure in the training or I'm a visual learner. So when you when you train somebody in orientation and ongoing, it should not be a one and done. Please refocus back on what's happening, maybe quarterly or biannually. We're, we're double checking to make sure everybody still knows what to do. Do we know how to use a mixer or a blender? Do we have those on site if we need it? Review the health and safety alerts, making sure people know how to write an incident report that includes what the item was choked on as well as pace and other factors that we talked about in previous slides. Making sure your staff is current on CPR and first aid, that's crazy, that's really critical, and we're, we're practicing how to do certain things as far as if we do have a choking incident, maybe do a little role playing. Some people make, uh, one of the things that we did or that was done was that we, they had a lot of different types of diets. They were, so they kind of condensed them down to four different types, regular, chopped, ground, and pureed. So that way it's easier for everybody to understand. Some OT and PT created placemats for the individuals that showed exactly what that individual needed to eat um, in the supervision and any kind of modifications that they needed. So make sure any kind of change in the diet results in immediate notifications to all the providers of service. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a picture is worth a thousand words. To me, this is wonderful because, like I said, I'm a visual learner, so I want to be able to see what it means. You know, we talk about right here a quarter inch size of food or a one inch size. We want to try to be mindful. Really, best practice is try to get a three dimensional example, one inch by one inch by one inch. Because I unfortunately read a case where somebody had a, a half inch by half inch piece of food, but it didn't talk about that third dimension, and they ate a burrito. So when you unrolled that burrito, it was like six inches. So be careful of things like that, you know, a three level layer cake, one inch by one inch, and now it's three inches tall. So, you know, being, being mindful of how actual big of a piece of food that you want to eat. Next slide, please. This is just another example. Some people like to see it, you know, what does it mean to have a one inch piece or a ground, just the size of a piece of grain of rice, um, pureed, no lumps, more like applesauce type of consistency. Um, some some people have used place car or uh, placemats that 
that tells the staff exactly what that person needs. It also is not only for the staff, but maybe the individual wants to have some kind of independence. So they are gonna help double check to make sure everything is fine. One thing I do wanna mention real quickly before I turn it back over is you wanna make sure that if you see it and if somebody's plan and have a vague language of bite size or small bites, that's really, really vague. I, my size of bite may be different than Scott's. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you explain that. And that's where we kind of go with that three dimensional. So if you see that language, you want to make sure you kind of get that rectified with the team. And I'm going to turn this back over to Connie. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so real quickly, we just want to uh, let you know some of the things that we have done as a state and partnership with the county boards and providers is to really just ongoing raise awareness through trainings, through health and welfare alerts. Um, when we opened the MUI rule back up in 2019, we changed the investigation protocol to include more comprehensive um, requirements for choking related incidents. So more information can be gathered so we can learn more and do better for the people that we support. We've also used social media and different online uh, learning modules uh, so people have that as well. I'm gonna quickly go through the data, but I just wanted to share the results of the poll. So about 90% of the people that are um, attending today filled out the question, which is, have you or someone you know ever been, uh, ever choked? And 87% of you said, yes, you have, while 13% said no. So obviously it's something that's very commonplace, not only for, the, for ourselves, but for the people that we support. And so we just wanna constantly be mindful of that. Um, like we talked about, the choking-related um, medical emergencies are situations where someone is actively choking and they need someone to take action to, you know, in essence, save their life, either through back blows, abdominal blows, abdominal thrusts, excuse me, um, you know, using 911. And so, like we talked about, choking relief remains the highest life-saving measure performed um, that we found in these medical emergencies. And they account for about 75 to 81% per year of all medical emergencies that we see. I'm not gonna go through this data um, all. Um, I think you'll have it and you can refer back to it, but you can see that this just illustrates that point more that again, this is by far the way that we are keeping people safe by doing these kind of interventions that's so um, badly needed. In terms of choking incidents, you can see from this graph that every year we have anywhere between 350 to 430 some choking related medical MUIs, uh, medical emergency MUIs, I should say. And in the majority of those cases, you or someone you know, a direct support professional or other caregiver have taken some kind of action to save that person's life, to stop them from you know, losing consciousness or, or passing away or um, as a result of that choking. So we can't thank you enough for all that you do every day to keep people safe. Unfortunately, we also know that in many of these cases, um, too many of these cases, People from maybe seven to 21 people each year die of choking related deaths. And that's, you know, 21 people too many. That's 21 um, individuals that we support um, that sometimes we could prevent that from occurring. So we want to all work together. Thankfully, this year, we've only had one choking related death thus far. And so we want to make sure that we're constantly, constantly keeping this um, top of mind, making it a discussion point in our trainings and our meetings, and always looking for ways that we might be able to help each other to prevent choking. Um, finally, um, before I hand it back over to Scott, I want to talk about some resources. These were included in your choking prevention um, guidebook or uh, resource guide. And if you're not aware, DODD has a YouTube channel. Yep, we're that hip. And we have lots of free short videos. And in the resource guide, we included the length of those videos. 
many of them they go over like specialized diet, like how to prepare a chopped diet. Um, you know, they're less than five minutes long and are a great um, training resource for you and your staff. So please check those out. Those links are included in your resource guide. We also included uh, common terms, other resources, and choking uh, specific to people that we support. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Scott to close us out. Sounds good. Thank you, Connie. And again, thanks everybody for attending today. I, I can't help but, uh, you know, just be really, really thankful uh, for the numbers, the numbers of people that have turned out to, to listen and to hear uh, what's going on. And I know we've covered a lot of information in an hour's time, um, but I'm hopeful that the information we've covered is going to make you really think about the work that you do, the lives that you change tomorrow when you go into work, the people that you, that you know potentially have a choking risk, you can take some of the information that we've shared today and really think it through and make sure that the team is working hard to the best address issues to make sure people get the food that they want and they like and they deserve. Um, but you try to do that in a way that makes the most sense to be safe for them because, uh, you know, as we've mentioned here and, and Connie just shared in some of the slides, you know, there can be tragic outcomes if we don't really do a good job of preventing um, situations from occurring. Diet texture, supervision, you know, making sure those kinds of things happen. Um, and wrapping up, you guys are the experts. You're the folks that, that see people every day. And you're the ones that can, can communicate and share that information to make sure um, that, that the, right, the right risk assessment happens and that the prevention plans happen, you know, that makes sense. So we have the right supervision. We have the right diet texture. We have the right prompting during the meal. You're an advocate for somebody. And obviously, you care enough to be on this call to hear about what's happening throughout the state. And again, it's what I love about the data that we have. It's not, it's not made up data. It's data that's happening every day to people that live in Ohio who receive supports. And you guys are the folks that are working with folks and impact uh, their daily lives. So the communication that you share, you know, keeping your eyes and ears open about what's happening, identifying potential choking episodes or, or potential choking uh, reflexes, whatever might be occurring, that information is so critical. So please don't ever hesitate. You know, if you think there's a concern, share it with somebody and make sure we get the right the right assessment done, the right follow-up, and the right team decisions made to, to really help somebody um, to avoid a, a terrible outcome as it could happen related to a choking death. And as Connie mentioned, I think that that last slide is so important. I know it's like over 95% of the time when a choking episode happens, you know, folks are intervening and they're saving people's lives every day, every day. Um, and, and I can't thank you enough for that. I can't thank you for being here for this training. and I can't thank you for the work that you do. Uh, and the work that's really been a challenge, particularly over the last year. Um, I guess I'll turn it back to Connie. If you have any questions, um, you know, I know we're, we're out of time. I know we're three minutes past. I appreciate you hanging with us. Um, Connie, I think maybe we can handle questions uh, and get back to folks if there are some. Yes, thank you, Scott. So um, this last slide includes contact information. I wanted to let you know if you have included a question in the chat box, we will type all those up and include responses and send those back out to everyone that participated today. So look for that and any additional information. And please, if you have resources to share, good assessments or other tools that you think would benefit other people around the state, please share those with us and we will share those with everyone that attended today. So thank you again. Look forward to um, going through those questions and getting information out and look for your certificate within 30 days and thank you all for attending and thank you for our speakers today for sharing their expertise with, with all of us. Have a great day. Absolutely, have a great day guys, take care.